Well, our text this morning is, is really quite brief. It's only one verse, but it kind of summarizes everything we're going to be looking at this morning. And what it is, is the purpose statement. You know how John writes an entire gospel and then doesn't tell us why he writes it until the very end? Well, he, he does the same thing in, in his first letter, you know, why he wrote these things. And this is why. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, if we were to use this verse alone to answer the question, is infallible assurance, I mean, the absolute certainty that I'm saved, does that come along with saving faith in Christ? If it did, then why would this, was this book written? Okay? I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Well, you should already know that you have eternal life. But the purpose of the book is so that you may know that you have eternal life, that you don't have a, a false faith, a false assurance, but a genuine assurance, you know, that you really do belong to Christ. How can you know that? Well, that's what the book was, you know, the reason for the book, and uh, that's why we're going to be looking at it uh, this morning, and obviously we're not going to have a chance to go through it in its entirety, but I, I do want to just hit some of the highlights. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to merge it with what we're looking at this evening. You know, this evening, as I've already told you, uh, Dr. Godfrey is going to deal with the issue of assurance and conversion. Now, this morning, th those things really are related, but this morning we're going to focus on assurance in particular, okay? And he's going to remind us, first of all, of what Robert Bellarmine, that's a name that comes up uh, among the uh, teachers at Ligonier, because he was an Italian Roman Catholic theologian, very famous theologian. He was born four years, born four years after Luther died, so he's not necessarily, a, uh, he's not a contemporary of Luther, but he's only one of 36 men in the Roman Catholic Church ever to be given the title of doctor of the church. Well, Robert Bellarmine, uh, we're going to hear what he believed was the greatest of all the Protestant heresies, all the ways that we deviate from Rome. Now, we might think that it was justification by grace through faith alone. And let's not forget the Roman church believes you need grace, but it's the faith alone part that they didn't agree with because the grace you get from the sacraments and you cooperate with it and you earn justification. You know, that they, you, we might think that they would disagree with that, that we're saved just solely by trusting in what Christ did for sinners, okay? But that wasn't the case. In his opinion, the most dangerous belief, our most dangerous belief, is assurance that we can know that we are Christians and that we will go to heaven. Now, we might want to ask this question, what did he have against assurance? You know, why didn't he want that? Why do you think it was a bad thing? Well, he believed that knowing that somebody has eternal life will lead that person to careless living. It really won't matter how we live because we know that we're eventually going to get to heaven anyway. Now, have you ever heard that? I mean, have you ever heard that people who do that, you know, people who look at eternal security, that's, you know, that's often the way it's put in um, evangelical circles. You know, we call it perseverance of the saints, and there's a very important distinction there. But they call it eternal security. Once saved, always saved. And if I'm saved, it doesn't really matter how I live. I'm still going to go to heaven. The college I went to developed it, sadly, uh, to its extreme and believe that, again, a person could be genuinely saved, but could devote their lives to the destruction of the church and blaspheme Christ in every possible way, but because he believed once, they're still going to go to heaven. That's a very, very dangerous belief. But that's what Robert Bellman thought would happen if Christians became convinced that they really were saved. Now, he believed that Rome's view was the only right and safe view, that God justifies only those who actually are just, who are personally holy, perfectly sanctified. In his view, you can only become that through the Roman church. Again, you have to receive grace through the sacraments. And only Rome has the priesthood that can actually give you that grace because the priest has to be in succession with Peter and once you receive that grace through the sacraments, you work with that grace to overcome your sins 
until you become perfect. Now, if you don't know then at any point along the line that you're safe, then you're going to continue to strive down that path for perfection, the perfection that will make you safe, and that will keep you from pursuing sin. You see how that view works? Uh, to keep you from falling into that view we just saw. Now, Bellarmine might have had good motives. You know, he, he wants to see Christians doing the right thing. But he was wrong in thinking that his view would actually encourage godly living. Rome's view can only produce formalism, okay? The idea that if I clean up my outside, the way that I live, it will convince me that I'm okay on the inside. Now, we believe, on the other hand, that justification by grace through faith alone is really the only way to a godly life. You know, as, as over against Bellarmine, and as over against the antinomians, you know, the, the licentious sort of, you know, evangelicals that believe you can live any way you want. Now, God tells us plainly in His Word that we can be justified, we can only be justified by trusting in Jesus, okay, in His obedience to make us righteous, in His death to take away our sins. And it's quite clear that there's nothing we can do to make ourselves acceptable to Him. We cannot do it through works. If we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father sees us clothed with Christ, and He declares us to be righteous even though we are still personally unrighteous. Remember what I read in our meditation, Romans 4, 5. Paul writes, but to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Rome believes that God only justifies those who are personally just or godly. And Paul teaches that God justifies the ungodly who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember, Luther called this, this trust in Christ and what happens when we do, the great exchange. Jesus takes us as his bride and all that is ours becomes His. Remember that? Well, all that we have is guilt, and He takes that. And all that is His becomes ours, okay? His righteousness, His atonement, His title to the kingdom. That all becomes ours through faith in Christ, and that is what justifies. But most importantly to our purpose, His Spirit also becomes ours. Jesus gives us His Spirit. Now, this morning, I want us to consider that we can have assurance. We can know that we have been justified, that we are saved, that this great exchange has taken place in our lives when we see the Spirit working in us to make us like Christ. Now, contrast that with the view that, that we were looking at before in, in broad evangelicalism. This does not give us a license to sin, as Bellarmine feared that it would. If we think we're saved, then we'll just live any way we want. Now, what the biblical doctrine says is this, that the godliness that the Spirit of God produces in our lives is the only way we can know that we are justified. It's the only way we can have assurance is when we live a godly life. And really, the more godly we become, and that is obeying Christ from the heart, the more assured we will be. Now, this is simply to say what the Reformers said. We are justified by, by grace alone through faith alone. Okay, we want to make sure we're clear on that. But they also said, not by a faith that is alone. It will always be accompanied by sanctification. It will always be accompanied with good works. The good works don't justify us, they, but what they do is they are the evidence. They show that we have been justified, that we have the Spirit of God working in our lives. Now, let's consider first from our passage that contrary to Bellarmine, contrary to Rome, we can know that we have eternal life. Now, the Lord says a lot about this throughout the Bible. It's amazing how much is actually in there, but He's given us an entire letter as well that is devoted to this very subject, 1 John. And I've already told you the verse that we're looking at tells us why John wrote the letter. Let me read it again. 
These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, the first question we need to ask is, why was John writing this particular letter to, uh, to his audience to help them come to that assurance? Well, he originally wrote this letter to refute a philosophical belief that was just beginning to come on the scene, what we today call Gnosticism. Don't want to get technical here, and I really can't because I'm, I'm not a philosopher, but Gnosticism is a form of Greek dualism, okay, where they saw, you know, th that these two contrasting principles of good and evil, and in their view, Gnostic view, um, everything that is spirit is good. Everything that is material or matter is evil. They believe that the source from which everything came, the one, is, is a pure spirit. And that this spirit, by its nature, is spewing out its essence or its substance. And as it does, it's creating other spiritual beings called eons. These spiritual beings, in turn, also create other spiritual beings. They are emanating their substance as well. Well, what happens is this continues on and on until you get this being, this spiritual being that is so far from the one that it somehow becomes corrupt and it creates the material universe which by nature is evil. And guess, guess what the name of that particular spiritual being is? It would be Elohim in their view, okay? The God of the Bible, okay? So he's an evil God. He creates the evil universe. Now, this understanding of God led them to believe that Jesus, and they believed that Jesus oh, was the Son of God, they believed that Jesus came to save us, but he couldn't really have been a man because to be a man is to be material, and to be material is to be evil. So he must have only appeared to be a man. Does that sound familiar? That's uh, the heresy that we call docetism, where Christ or, you know, the man Christ Jesus couldn't have been a man, so he only appeared to be a man. He was really just sort of like a, a phantom that was walking through the world, a pure spiritual being. They also believe that he didn't come to save us by dying on the cross, but rather he came to save us by bringing us a special knowledge. This is where Gnosticism gets its name, because the, the Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. So he gives us this special knowledge that would show us how we can escape the prison house of the body and be reunited with the one, which is the ultimate goal, I guess, of the universe, and that's what salvation is. They further believe that since our bodies were evil anyway, that it didn't really matter how we lived. We could indulge the flesh and it didn't matter. Now, think of, of what we're going to look at in 1 John from this perspective. First of all, this teaching seduced some who were professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and led them away from the church. Listen to what John writes in 1 John 2.19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Okay, who are these that went out? Well, they're the Antichrist that went out, those who were contrary to Christ. They were the ones who denied that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. Okay, get the connection? They were following the Gnostic belief that all the material universe is evil. So why is John writing this letter? First of all, to say that those who went out after that belief are, are not true believers, but also to show those who remain how they can know that they really are true believers and really how do they know? Because they believe Jesus has come in the flesh and they live a godly life, okay? So he's writing this so that they would be assured that they really do belong to Jesus Christ and they are not going to go out like these others and end up perishing, but that they really do have eternal life. Now, John says that if they could see certain things in their lives, then they could know that they belong to Christ, okay? These things I've written to you who believe so that you may know that you have eternal life. And what are these things? Well, the things that he writes about in his letter. That's what the letter's about. Now, let's again remember at this point that we're not talking about justification. We're talking about assurance, 
how can I know that I have been justified? We're justified by trusting in Jesus Christ alone to save us, okay? But there will be evidence that that has taken place. How can we know that it has? Well, why do we need to have some kind of evidence? Well, we've already seen, how do we know we're going to hold fast to Christ? But think about the great exchange. How do we know the great exchange has taken place? How do we know that everything that is ours has become Christ and everything that is His has become ours? How do we know we're justified by His righteousness? Because what is justification? Justification is simply a declaration by God that you are righteous. And being righteous, you know, you're welcomed into His family and, and you are His forever. But did you hear Him say that? You know, can you hear the Lord in heaven declare you to be righteous? Can you see yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, is there an indicator light somewhere on your body that lights up? You know, it's red when you come into this world, but turns green when you're justified. That would be nice, wouldn't it, for assurance sake? But, but no, there isn't something like that. So how can we know that we are justified? Well, John actually gives us three ways in the book. And the first kind of goes without saying, but we do need to understand it's very, very important, okay? We could never have an assurance if God had never given us a promise. So God has given us a promise, and that promise is in 1 John 2.25. He says, this is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life, okay? Well, what is, who is the He and when did He make that promise? Well, one of the places is in John 3.16. Everyone who believes in Him, and this is Jesus saying this, He's speaking of Himself in the third person. Everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. You realize if Jesus hadn't made that promise, there's no way we could have assurance. Right? There has to be a promise. Our assurance has to be based on this promise. So if we have met the qualification, believe, trust, we have what is promised, eternal life. And by the way, I could add this, I think I will at this point, uh, when John the Baptist is giving us a commentary on what Jesus says in John chapter 3 after Jesus says this. John the Baptist says, everyone who believes in the Son has, has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, that, that's interesting, okay? If you believe, you have eternal life, but if you don't obey, well, you, you expect him to say, if you don't believe, you, the wrath of God abides on you, but he says obey. And the other interesting thing is this, is that the word believe and obey is the same word in the Greek, and it's typically translated believe. But the point that the translators are making is simply this, that the kind of faith that saves, the kind of belief, is a belief that acts upon what it believes. It's a working faith. So that's, again, the idea is it's life transforming, this saving faith. Okay, but then, how do we know that we have believed, savingly trusted in the Lord? Well, again, it's these, these works. God has given us the Spirit to show us in, in a couple of different ways. Okay, the first way is that He convinces us. The Spirit of God convinces us. John writes in 1 John 3, 24, We know by this that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. Well, how does the Spirit convince us that we are justified, that we are saved? Well, Paul tells us a little bit more about this in Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. He says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay, so there's this testimony of the Holy Spirit. What is that testimony? Some say it's directly to our souls. The Spirit of God gives us that assurance that we belong to God. Others would say it's the confidence the Spirit of God gives us to call God our Father and to know in our hearts that it's true. But there is more than that, okay? That certainly is true. The Spirit of God gives us that confidence. That is His testimony to us that we belong to God. But the Spirit of God also makes changes in our lives. And that is the third way, which is related to the second. The Spirit shows us we belong to God 
in working by working in us to make us like Jesus. Sanctification follows justification. It proves that we are justified. Now, remember Bellarmine's objection to the Protestant view that assurance leads to a sinful life. It's really just the opposite, isn't it? A godly life by the power of the Holy Spirit leads to assurance. I mean, that, that is what the Bible teaches. And that's the way it should be. When we, when we drop the idea of my life has to change at all or good works at all, then, then you do fall into the trap that Bellarmine was afraid of. But if those good works are actually the evidences of the Spirit of God that prove the justification, then our assurance in large part comes from that change of life, those good works. It does not lead us to a, a licentious life. So now we need to ask the question, what does that look like? What is Christ-likeness? What is sanctification? What does holiness look like? That is really the main thing that John is talking about when he talks about these things. We call these the marks of grace, the evidences that we are justified. Okay? So what I want us to do, and we, you know, we have just very little time left, but I want us to take what we could call, <laughs> I remember how Sinclair Ferguson was, what was he talking about, the Galatians test or the Ephesians test, I forget. We're going to take the first John test, okay? And this is going to be um, a very personal test. So I am going to use the word you, and I'm not just looking at you, I'm looking at myself as well. But we need to examine our lives by these evidences. So let me just ask them quickly. And you respond, not verbally, but in your own hearts, okay? First of all, do you believe, okay? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Second, are you trusting in the true Christ, you know, the, the, the real Jesus, the one who has come in the flesh, the one who is man as well as God? And do you believe that he not only was a man and, of course, God on the earth, but also remains so in heaven? Do you have the anointing that teaches you all things? Has the Spirit of God convinced you that the Bible is God's truth? And are you walking in the light of that truth, living by that truth? Are you practicing righteousness, practicing what God commands, and not practicing sin. When you sin, do you confess your sins to God and forsake your sins rather than deny the fact that you've sinned at all? Do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ because they are God's image? And are you laying down your life for them and helping them with their needs? Do you hate the world? And stand firm against the temptations of the world? Do you faithfully worship your Lord and serve Him in His church? Do you profess the true faith openly, even if it means that the world will hate you? Now, if these things are true of us, and remember, not perfectly, but, but, but really, then we can know that we have eternal life. And by the way, as I've said, this isn't the only thing written in the Bible on this subject. We could also add if the Beatitudes describe us, if the fruits of the Spirit are present in our lives, if we have the love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13. And these are just a few examples of the, the many, many examples. You know, Peter talks about pursuing certain virtues. And by pursuing these things, it convinces us that we belong to the Lord. It shows that we are His. Now, again, John is not telling us that we have to be perfect to know that we're saved. He says, if you think you're perfect, you aren't saved. You, you can know that for sure. Um, he says in 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So he's not talking about perfection, okay? But we do need to have a love for God that's strong enough to move us to take seriously what He says, seriously to the point where we're not doing certain things, the sinful things, and doing our duty, okay? Now, it's not enough on the basis of this, it's not enough simply to believe that you're a Christian, okay? Those that John wrote to, um, the ones that left thought they were. 
okay? The, uh, Jesus talks about, remember the parable of the sower and the different types of soil? Um, at least three of those types of soil thought they were true believers, but only one really was. It's not enough to think you're a Christian. It's not enough to be baptized, is it? Uh, that's another ongoing issue in the church, but um, we don't believe we're saved through baptism. Baptism doesn't save anyone. If it did, then you know, Jesus would be baptizing and Paul would be baptizing, but um, actually Paul says, I thank God I didn't baptize any of you, except this person and his household and that person. You know, baptism is not what saves us. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not enough to believe that what the Bible says is true and to believe all the things about the gospel. I mean, the devils believe. They know these things are true, and they tremble that they're not saved. It's not enough to pray the sinner's prayer. That prayer means nothing without genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not even enough to join with the church and to attend church faithfully. You know, that's not enough to, you know, the, to prove you're a Christian, though every true believer will do those things. Jesus says this in John 10, 27 through 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. How do we know that we belong to Christ, that we are His sheep? We hear His voice, we follow Him. We follow Him because we love Him. Okay, it's just as simple as that. Now, let me, let me read something that John Gerson wrote in his um, Rational Biblical Theology of Edwards. I thought he said it pretty well, and he also quotes Edwards in here. So he says, good works not only have the qualities spoken of above, they are also very convincing demonstrations of the reality of Christians' experience. When Satan sees them, he knows that he has been defeated and that one of his former captives is his no more. It is not mere profession that convinces Satan, but practical holiness alone. Such actual holiness is convincing to men as well as devils. Quote, and this is Edwards, a manifestation of godliness in a man's life and walk is a better grounds of others' charity concerning his godliness than any account that he gives about it in words, close quote. It runs as a refrain through Edward's preaching that actions speak louder than words. Indeed, in his most famous treatise on the subject, religious affections, with respect to others and to oneself, the greatest test of religious experience is clearly this one. That is, good works, okay? Done out of a heart of love for the Lord. In his sermon on Psalm 139, 23, and 24, Edwards compares the witness of a godly life with the power of preaching. Quote, if those who call themselves Christians thus walked in all the paths of virtue and holiness, it would tend more to the advancement of the kingdom of Christ in the world, the conviction of sinners, and propagation of religion among unbelievers than all the sermons in the world so long as the lives of those who are called Christians continue as they are now, close quote. So he's saying that is the most powerful witness that we can give for, to ourselves and to others and to the devil. And if we don't have these good works, these changes, these fruits of the Spirit in our lives, we should not believe that we belong to him. So if we're trusting Jesus Christ alone, and these things describe us, which they will if we are actually trusting Jesus, okay, then we can know that we have eternal life. Now let me just address one last thing. If we're still not sure, and I think you know, this raises probably doubts in some of our minds, it should, because the evidence in our lives is weak. You know, there's really not a whole lot that we can really point to and say, you know, yes, I fit this description. I measure up to this standard. What do we do? Well, we need to spend more time with God. That's, that's what we've seen before. We need to spend more time with Him. Um, in His Word, in worship, in prayer, and fellowship, we need to look to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and continue to look to Him. And as John Owen reminded us and Thomas Goodwin, remember the love that God the Father has for us and that the Son has for us. And we need to let that love 
cause our love to grow stronger. We need that spiritual sight of, of the object of our affections, the Lord Jesus, and again, the Father, to strengthen our own love. And then as our love grows stronger, we will see the evidence that we've been looking at more clearly because it is the fruit of love. Genuine love will move us to do what our Lord calls us to do. So may the Lord give to each of us that we would do this, spend more time with the Lord, until we grow into a full assurance that we belong to Him. This evening, I'm going to read a portion of the Westminster Confession that reminds us that full assurance is not something that every believer has, but something we have to strive after. That's interesting, isn't it? But we, we shouldn't settle for anything less. That that should be what we're pursuing is this full assurance, but it requires the pursuit of God and the pursuit of what He has called us to do in order to attain it. Full assurance, not just any assurance, but full assurance, and we'll make that distinction more this evening. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's, um, let's ask that the Lord would move us in that direction, help us to see from what we've seen the importance of knowing that we have eternal life and, and how it is we, we can know.